And uh, yeah, first uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for uh, the opportunity to present here. And uh, so yeah, uh, my talk uh, will be, I guess, of something different uh, now. So uh, it, it will have something to do with uh, homogenization and uh, dimension reduction on the other hand. Uh, in the theory of uh, linear elasticity. And uh, so I just want to make a comment here. So uh, it seems that it's useful to study uh, materials which are a composite, so which are composed of different other materials. So let's say that you have a material which uh, has some inclusions of uh, other material inside. And uh, it also seems that it's uh, convenient from the perspective of uh, numerics, let's say, to, to approximate such, uh, such material with a homogeneous, with a homogeneous one, to, to replace such a model for such material with a model for a homogeneous one. On the other hand, it's, uh, sometimes you may also have uh, some uh, thin medium. And it's also uh, from, the, from the point of view of maybe numerics or uh, modeling, it's uh, easier to, it's uh, useful to replace a model for a thin something with model for infinitely thin, thin something. And this is what we would call dimension reduction, and this is what would be called uh, homogenization. And uh, so, but actually I'm going to focus now on this operator norm uh, stuff. So uh, first uh, part of the talk will be introduction into all of this. And uh, we will be doing uh, actually these two things uh, simultaneously. So uh, this is what we, we call the simultaneous homogenization and dimension reduction. And these rods are uh, simply thin, thin long uh, structures. So uh, these things appear uh, often, so uh, any bridge maybe you look at as a thin heterogeneous structure or a tectonic plate, I don't know, or a skyscraper or whatever. So uh, let's begin with the introduction. So you know how uh, when you model something, you, you might, uh, so let's begin with the elliptic uh, PDE case. So you might look at this uh, operator, which defines how your uh, material uh, acts. And then uh, you store material coefficients into a matrix here. And uh, now this matrix will depend on the position in the body. So it will depend on the variable x here, which, uh, which uh, says that it's different along, uh, depending on which position in the body you are. And if, it, uh, if you fix some small parameter uh, epsilon, which will be, which will we call the period of oscillations. And I want to describe what is uh, periodically oscillating a material, then uh, if this A, depending on epsilon, at the position X, is equal to some fixed matrix A at the position of X over epsilon, where this fixed matrix A is Y periodic, where Y is this cube of one in each direction, then you know that uh, A epsilon is uh, also periodic with a period uh, epsilon in each direction. So uh, that's what I mean uh, by, uh, uh, by that, that we have a material which is uh, oscillating. The period of oscillations is uh, epsilon and it's uh, heterogeneous. So uh, this, um, this matrix depends on X. And now you wonder uh, what happens when epsilon goes to zero, but you do not only uh, wonder uh, what, what, is the, what is this limit uh, model, but you also care for uh, what happens with some uh, semi-groups related with this operator, what happens with the spectrum of this operator when epsilon goes to zero. And uh, it turns out that uh, if you want to study this, you should study the resolvent problem for this operator. So, so the resolvent problem looks like this, A epsilon, uh, U epsilon, plus here you can put any parameter which is away from the spectrum. And here in this picture, you see what I mean by oscillating periodic medium. So uh, this uh, cell is periodically appearing at uh, the the size of, its, of this cell, of side of this cell is epsilon. And uh, you can, uh, so this is pretty much standard, to define a fixed matrix which, uh, of uh, so-called homogenized medium, which does not depend on X by this formula, uh, mi this minimization formula, and define the operator with this ex differential expression uh, related to this matrix. And if you were to study uh, this uh, resolvent problem here, you could prove 
that uh, you have this sort of qualitative approximation result that if the right hand sides would converge weakly, let's say, then, then also the solutions would converge weakly to the solution of this. So you could prove su such qualitative result, but still you don't know. So when uh, say that you are using numerics, you want to replace model with another one, you don't know what kind of error are you making uh, so far by, by replacing the models. And uh, you, want to, you want to see at which rate does this happen, what, what's, what happens with the spectrum of A epsilon and so on. And it turns out that in order to answer these questions, you can uh, try to compute estimates of these, uh, this, this is called resolvent operator in an operator norm. And if you have that, then you would, uh, then you would immediately have uh, the answers to this. For example, uh, for the elliptic case, uh, Birman and Suslina have done a lot of in this direction. So they proved a lot of uh, these types of estimates over the years. Uh, for example, you, you can have the estimate in L2 to L2 operator norm, which they proved to be of order epsilon. You can uh, have the estimate in L2 to H1 operator norm, which they also proved to be of uh, order epsilon, but you have to subtract some other operator here, which is called uh, standard uh, correction, corrector operator in theory of homogenization. And yeah, so uh, we are actually going to, I, I'm going to show you so this type of estimates for this situation of homogenization and dimension reduction in elasticity. And yeah, so people have been doing uh, this simultaneous homogenization and dimension reduction for years. For example, Professor Panasenko has a book on this uh, thin uh, composite materials. Uh, so my supervisor uh, has been studying it, uh, this a lot. So from the standpoint of uh, nonlinear stuff, gamma convergence and so on. And so recently, Chereni uh, Professor Cherenichenko and Velcic, they, uh, they got this norm resolvent estimates for the case of plates. And now I will show you them for the case of rods. Um, okay, so uh, another small comment that I want to tell you about, because this will appear later on, is that say that you are maybe studying the resolvent of uh, operator scaled by a small parameter eta here. You might be motivated for this by studying so uh, hyperbolic evolution, let's say, where the uh, inertia term is scaled with eta. So you know that, for example, you can apply a Laplace transform to this and you would obtain the resolvent, right? So, and this would be the same as studying uh, this type of equation with not scaled uh, inertia term, but in different time scale. So T tilde, where T tilde has this uh, square root of eta, is a square root of eta times T. And now look, for example, if eta, we are interested when eta is very, very small number. For example, say that eta is 0 0.01. This is just for the interpretation. And say that you, in time T, you have 10 seconds. Then time uh, t tilde would, uh, would, would be one second, and uh, you would have 10 seconds of events in time t compressed into one second of time t tilde. So that would be like pressing the fast forward button and uh, uh, seeing everything going very fast. So actually, the reason for studying uh, this uh, uh, where, where this would appear is uh, because you are watching at some events which are very slow and you're trying to fast forward them to, to see them normally. So this would, this would be uh, studying uh, some, some very slow phenomena, let's say. Okay, and now I want to tell you something about this uh, heterogeneous elastic rods so that I can formulate our results. So the rod would be a domain which is uh, defined with a cross section and uh, multiplied by a uh, real line. So you take some uh, omega uh, cross section and then uh, with omega h, so now you have two parameters. Here you have uh, also h, which is, the, which is the thickness of the domain. So you define this contraction of, uh, of, uh, of a cross section. You define your rod in this way. And uh, then you want to say that the rod is heterogeneous and uh, with oscillating uh, parameters. So you define this y which is the period of the oscillations. Then, you know, the system of elasticity is a 3D system is a system of equations. So if you want to store all the material properties which can be uh, stored, you need a tensor of three times three times three times three uh, entries. And uh, here we have, we have taken this, this tensor to depend only on variable x3, but uh, as you see here, 
but we can also, and extend that we, we are periodicity, but we can also take it to be of uh, x1, x2, x3. It just needs to be periodic with respect to x3, and we need to put x3 over epsilon here. It will all be the same. But for simplicity, let, let it just depend on x3. x3 is this uh, variable which goes along the road. So we want the oscillations to appear along the length of the road. And these are some standard assumptions. So uh, in theory of elasticity, you want it to be uniformly positive definite on, uh, on uh, symmetric matrices. That's what you need. Um, and yeah, so uh, another, another uh, uh, assumption would be for, for simplicity, let's say that this omega is centrally symmetric. So you have the origin in the middle and, and it's centrally symmetric. Uh, this, this operator S is the operator of central symmetry. This is just for uh, some uh, nicer uh, computations and uh, so that we can express things nicer. So this is the picture of the rod. And this is what I mean by uh, heterogeneous rod. So you see how its material coefficients are periodically uh, appearing along, repeating along the, along the length. You see that the period is epsilon and you see that the width of the rod is h. And uh, this might be problematic. So uh, you see, we want to prove some convergence we, uh, and uh, some estimates. We need to have a fixed Hilbert space for every h. And this, uh, this, uh, uh, this domain is shrinking, right? So what you want actually is to, to work on a f domain of fixed, uh, fixed width and, have, and uh, this will in return change your operator a bit, as I will show you later. So this is some standard stuff in the theory of uh, dimension reduction. And... Uh, yeah, so this is how the operator looks like. It's in its divergence form. This is its differential expression. Here you see that the uh, coefficients are oscillating. This symmetrized gradient is just uh, something that appears in the theory of elasticity, linear theory. It has some uh, domain. <coughs> and uh, we are now interested in the case when both this uh, period of os oscillations and the thickness goes to zero, go to zero simultaneously. And uh, yeah, okay, for some reason we are interested in the case when they go to zero at, uh, with the same order, when, when they are of the same order. And for simplicity, we might just say that epsilon is equal to h, just, uh, just for simplicity here. And what happens then when you rescale your, this is the weak formulation of uh, the resolvent problem for a, when you rescale it on a fixed domain omega, which is of thickness one, then uh, you had to change this gradient here a bit. So you see that uh, this one over epsilon appeared here from the rescaling of the domain. Okay, and uh, now you have this, and I want to show you some, <clears throat> so uh, immediately, uh, like before, one can prove that, uh, so by using some uh, theory of uh, Grissot maybe, or uh, any, other, uh, 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 any other theory which is adapted for dimension reduction, you can see that uh, this sequence of uh, solutions would approximate the function of this type. Okay, so uh, let me just explain what this is. So you see here uh, four functions. You see B1, B2, A, and D. So B1 and B2 would be, so the solution of elasticity is this uh, function called uh, displacement. So how, how far from, the, from its original position has the, has the uh, point go, gone when it was deformed, when the body was deformed. So B1 and B2 explain uh, how much did the, uh, body, how much did this uh, um, point x3 moved from uh, out of line? So the rod looks like this. So how much did this point move out of line in each direction? And this is what I would call bending displacement. Then you have this A, uh, which explains how much did it move in line. And this is what I would call stretching displacement because it stretches in, in and out. And this D is what we call torsion. So how much did it twist at some point? And uh, this function would satisfy this limit problem. So in some ways you, you could define this uh, homogenized tensor again with some minimization procedure. You would see here that you have equation of the fourth order for the bending part. This is standard in the theory of elasticity. You get increased, uh, by the, for the theory of uh, dimension reduction, you get increased uh, order of, uh, of uh, equation in the end. And uh, here you see some, uh, something else appearing. So this is an operator of uh, momentum. So it turns out that you don't need the whole 
information on the forces to know how your rod will bend. You just need information on some of, some of its uh, momentums, let's say. I'll show you later what it is. And uh, just a, f a quick comment. So uh, all, the, all, the, uh, all the results are presented uh, together with uh, respect to this assumption. So let's say that you have some additional assumption on this uh, tensor here. So these assumptions, uh, I don't know what they are called, but uh, additional material symmetries, there are some materials which uh, are quite uh, frequent. They, uh, they have these assumptions. So for example, isentropic materials satisfy these sort of assumptions. Let's say that you have that. And let's say that you define two uh, mutually orthogonal subspaces of L2. Uh, and I would call them bend and stretch. You'll see why. So let's say that this, uh, this space here is all the functions which are even with respect to first two, uh, so with respect to central symmetry in the first two components and odd in the third component. And here are all the functions which are odd in first two components and even in third component. Then these two spaces turns, turn out to be invariant for our operator. So it means that if A would act on something from L2 band, the resulting vector would be again in L2 band. And uh, also in the end, you would also have that this uh, limit tensor would split into two parts. It would split into bending part and stretching part, much like it, if it was block diagonal matrix. Okay, it would be block diagonal matrix actually. Uh, you see uh, this, uh, the consequence on this to the limit problem here is that it would split into two uncoupled uh, problems. So under these, uh, one would be of the fourth order, right? One would be of the second order. And uh, so under these additional assumptions, you have this splitting. Otherwise, you won't. Otherwise, you have that they are uh, bound together, this, these two types of uh, displacements. And here is the picture of what I meant. So if, uh, if at this point you have F1 and F2 the same as in uh, this point, uh, then they are odd in the first two components. This would cause bending so uh, somehow intuitively. But if you, if you would have that they are... Uh, even in uh, these two points with first two components, but, uh, odd, but it, it, they are odd, but even in the third component, then this would cause uh, the stretching of the rod or maybe twisting as well. So uh, uh, actually uh, bending would cause the uh, stretching and the other way and vice versa, unless you have these uh, additional assumptions, then, then it would be separated. And uh, I just want to formulate the results. So I have to define the operators. Here I have the operator of fourth order for the bending part, of the second order for the stretching part. This one under no additional assumptions, which is of mixed order. I have force momentum operators. So you see uh, F1 and F2 would cause uh, the rod to bend, that, of course, but also the derivatives of F3 in the sense of uh, functionals would cause the bend to, uh, rod to bend. And this is the, the final result which we have. And maybe I can just uh, explain what do we see here. So uh, first of all, you see that we have scaled the resolvents, scaled the operators with some, uh, with some coefficient. That's, uh, that's something what, what I was talking there. So let's first, uh, let's first look at these two uh, estimates. So what you see is that one resolvent is far from the other resolvent, this one is sandwiched between uh, these momentums, uh, you have some order of estimate. If you would plug, say, gamma equal to zero here, you would get the same as we saw before. Here it would disappear, here it would disappear, you would get the order of epsilon here. But for, the, and this would be the stretching case. But for the bending case, maybe, uh, gamma equal zero is not natural to take. You, here you, it would be more natural to take a gamma equal to two and if you would take gamma equal to two, here you would obtain one over epsilon two, uh, epsilon squared, which you then interpret that this uh, bending stuff, it happens much slower than the stretching stuff. So uh, bending waves, for example, or whatever um, phenomena which you, are, uh, which you are looking at happens much slower than the stretching stuff, which happens very fast compared to, compared to bending. And in the, in the, the, whole, the whole case you see uh, they are intertwined together. So there is no natural uh, scaling of uh, which you can take. So uh, you might as well have both of them. You might as well have all of them. 
And so these are L2 to L2 estimates. You can also have L2 to H1 type of estimate where you need to uh, remove this, uh, when you need to subtract this uh, corrector operator as we've seen before. And yeah, actually this is all I uh, have to say on this. So thank you for your attention. Um, yeah.